One of my favorite events of the year is coming up, the annual Stansbury Research Conference. And folks, the conference is now officially sold out for in-person tickets. But I'm not surprised. This is one of the best industry events out there. Some of the brightest financial minds will be sharing their biggest ideas and actionable stock recommendations, covering oil, cryptos, big tech, precious metals, real estate, gold, and so much more. Well, I have really good news. You can still access all this valuable information. Go to McCallStansburyBoston.com right now and reserve a live stream ticket. You can watch all the brilliant presentations in the comfort of your own home. Just one successful idea shared on stage could pay for your ticket and then some. I'm going to finish the touches on my presentation right now. And trust me, you won't want to miss what I have to say. So please go to McCallStansburyBoston.com for all the details including the amazing speaker lineup and how to get your live stream access. Again, that's McCallStansburyBoston.com. Folks, look for me on stage. Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's October 13th, 2022. Another beautiful day down here in South Florida. I have one of my favorite guests of all time coming up on today's show, Ryan Dietrich. Chief Market Strategist Carson Group. We're going to dive into the markets and we're going to talk about seasonality, midterms, and what it means for you right now and your money and the opportunities that lie ahead. Again, thanks for joining me. This is Matt McCall. It is the 13th of October, 2022. As I mentioned, one of my favorite guests in the world coming on, Ryan Dietrich. He's over at Carson Group now. He's a chief market strategist over there. If you've heard his name, uh, it's probably from me or from CNBC or Bloomberg or all the many places you see him in the media. The guy is one of the greatest market historians in the world. If you don't follow him on Twitter, you are truly missing out and hurting your portfolio. He puts together some of the greatest charts, the greatest stats that you've ever seen. Again, a uh, guy I've been following for many, many years now. He's been on my past podcast. Again, he's CNBC, Bloomberg, you name it. He guy is everywhere, quoted in Barron's. So I, I feel blessed to have him on because you're going to have the next 35 or 40 minutes of two stock market geeks breaking down where we are right now, having fun doing it. This is a show you cannot miss. Without further ado, here he is, the man, the myth, the legend, Ryan Dietrich from Carson Investment Research. Ryan, thanks so much for coming back on the show. Uh, you know, obviously, as you know, or you may not know, as my Viewers know I talk about you a lot on here. We use your numbers all the time. I think you're one of the greatest stats guy out there in Wall Street right now. So thanks so much for taking time and coming on the show. I know you're a busy guy. You're always out doing something. Um, and I will say this: your background has changed a bit. Uh, obviously, after the Super Bowl run last year, uh, you have uh, the big Joe Burrow behind you. Yeah. A bit of a rough year this year, I'll say. I still believe in your team, uh, but you know my team. I will have to brag about them while I can. Eagles are still undefeated, 5-0. and We'll see what happens Sunday night. But again, thanks so much. We're not, we can talk about sports a little bit. But let's jump into this market. And uh, you, know, you and I are basically market historians. And you know, let's just look, though, at this year, 2022. Um, just do, we, do we have to? 10, do we have to, Matt? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Seriously, I know. Yeah, do we have to? I know. I kind of just want to get to 2023 and turn this off. But kind of give me your big view, Ryan, of what you've seen so far this year and just kind of you're sitting there right now. How do you feel about the situation? Yeah, Matt. First off, thanks for having me back. It's an honor. And I mean, there's so many different ways we can go with this. I guess I'll put it like this. You know, stocks being the S&P 500 and bonds being the Barclays Ag. Down three quarters in a row for the first time in history. You know, I mean, the S&P time of recording this is what, down 24, 25%. Let's just call it a solid bear market. That's, I think, pretty surprising to investors. But what really surprises me is the fact that bonds are giving, you know, a diversified portfolio virtually, well, I guess, a little protection because they're not down as much as stocks. But but let's be honest, in history, when you have bear markets in stocks, bonds usually do well, like gain 10 percent or so. So that is what makes this year so you know, difficult and, and hard for your average investor when they're getting those statements and they're seeing things. You know, if you look at a 60-40 portfolio, right, 60% stocks, 40% bonds, this is the second worst year in history, only 2008, when the S&P lost ballpark 40%, but bonds gained about 10%. That year was worse. So this is, there's a lot we can talk about this year, but my goodness, just the fact that bonds are not helping is what really stands out to me. Yeah, I, I can tell you, you know, you talk, there's, there's people that invest in stocks that, that are not, I'm going to say, um, 
not aggressive, but they they you know, they like to buy stocks. They watch CNBC, that type of stuff. Then you have the investors kind of hands off. And a lot of them are probably more um, leaning towards a 60-40. They're getting their statements at the end of the third quarter and saying, what the hell is going on? They thought they were safe in these bond funds and they're getting absolutely killed. So what is the sediment that you're seeing out there and the numbers you're looking at for you know this average investor that is feeling something that they've maybe felt in 2008? Other than that, they've never felt this type of pullback before. Yeah, you're right. And also, let's think about you know, 2020. My goodness, bring up all the fun times, right? That was a five-week bear market. Believe me, it was devastating, down 34% in five weeks. But then in five months, we made it up and we we're back at new all-time highs, right? So it was so quick, right? This is, this we peaked, I believe it was on January 2nd, the first, second day of the year, first day of the year. And here we are like nine, 10 months later, and we're still, you know, in the, in the, in the depths of a bear market. So this is a slow, drawn out process, which normally is how bear markets are. Normally bear markets take about a year and you pull back ballpark you know, 27, 28% or so. Non-recessionary bear markets, so you pull back about 24%. And we're still in the camp. We're, in a, we're not in a recession, but hey, to an investor, does that matter or not? It's, it's, still, it's still how you're feeling. And to be honest, I totally forget what you asked me, but I'll just start, I'll just keep talking here. You know, I mean, <laughs> this is a midterm year. So here's another thing, Matt, like this is a midterm year. We know that. Well, the other thing we knew, the first three quarters of a midterm year historically are like three of the worst quarters out of an entire four-year presidential cycle, all right? 16 quarters, right? And yeah, we didn't think they'd be down this much, but to be down isn't super shocking. Your average midterm year is negative for the year on the S&P until wow. October 4th or 5th, one or the other, but through October, all right, early October is what I should say, that all the gains are back ended. So if there's any good news, you asked me about sentiment. I knew I'd get there if I talked yep. long enough. If there's <laughs> any good news at all, it is that, you know, historically we are in a very bullish seasonal time frame. The fourth quarter of midterm year, the next two quarters are some of the strongest periods. And then when you factor in sentiment, and believe me, there's tons of ways to measure sentiment. I mean, but the AAII sentiment poll, just one of your average mm -hmm. investor, right? Over 60% bears for the first time in history. The investor's intelligence, bull bear spreads, one of the widest we've ever seen. Finally, the VIX went in backwardation like yesterday, I think. So we're finally starting to see some fear in the in the, in the the VIX. Um, put the call ratios, 10-day put the call ratio, equity, CBOE, is starting to get to the area we've seen some major, major market lows. Doesn't mean we're going to bottom tomorrow. Doesn't mean it's going to happen immediately. But history would tell you, um, you know, what Churchill say, if everybody's thinking like somebody isn't thinking, right? It's actually, it's Patton, sorry. Patton said, yeah. if everybody's thinking like somebody isn't thinking, there's a lot of terrible stuff happening. And this year has been really rough. But everybody's thinking how bad it is. My goodness, we can talk about Twitter and stuff. Just a tweet. Look at any of my tweets. If they're remotely bullish, the people just pound me on there for being bullish. Yeah. That is sentiment that's out there. And when everyone's bearish, everyone's sold, we're likely closer to a low, which historically tends to happen in October for whatever reason. I mean, six of the last 17 bear markets ended in October. Se last thing I'll say on this, 74 and 2002 were the two worst years ever by the end of September. This is the third worst. You look at those two years. We made major bear market lows within the first two weeks of October. Who knows if it's going to happen again, but history can repeat itself, Mark Twain told us, and, and we'd be optimistic with sentiment negative and the bullish seasonals that investors should look for some opportunities here. It feels odd to say that because it's been devastating, but that's usually how markets work. You brought up the midterm election, Ryan, and I've been bringing this up on a show the last couple of weeks. I don't feel like the financial media is talking much about the midterm elections or right around the corner. And we could have a major shift uh, in D.C., but I, maybe I'm missing something. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like we're not we're talking about earnings. We're talking about inflation, interest rates. You don't really hear a lot about midterm elections. And obviously, because a lot of other things going on. Do you think that could be a catalyst once the elections happen early November? Yeah, I, you're right, Matt. And we talked about this on our team, on the investment research team at Carson Group, that, listen, midterms are here, but it's almost like nobody's talking about it. Uh, you know, they're important. And again, when you think about it, yes, we know, you know, Democrats have control. We, we, we're aware of that, but it's 50-50 Senate, right? And with the smallest majority in the House, like since, I think, 1870s, I believe. So how could things shake out? Well, we know what tends to happen, right? The incumbent party tends to lose because the party that lost the presidency is the motivated party. They gain about 30 seats on average. I give the Republicans a minor lead in the House, and they gain about four seats on average when it comes to the uh, Senate. Now, the way it works, though, there's, 100, there's 435 seats up in the House. They're all up. 
in the Senate, there's 100. Only like 33 or so of them are up for re-election. And only like 14 or 15 of them are, are, are potentially de- the Republicans can actually win because they're defending some of them. So what I'm getting at, uh, you know, the Republicans might take one seat or maybe we're still split. But at the end of the day, it's likely that we're going to still have pretty much some gridlock, right? You think about... um. Oh, the election, right? Oh, it was the election. November of 2020, right? We heard about blue wave, blue wave, blue wave. And then the election results came and it wasn't really a blue wave. The market kind of took off. I think that's because, you know, the the, the, gut, the um, markets don't like too much power one way or the other. It's not about red or blue. It's about too much power one way or the other. So if you can get kind of some gridlock in Washington, that can be a good thing, along with all the other negatives that are there. Maybe get some good news on inflation or maybe the Fed or maybe the war. But once we get through the uncertainty of this midterm election, and, and last thing I'll say on this, look in history, the best scenario for stocks is a Democratic president with both chambers of Congress Republican, and that's that's a, there's a good chance that could happen here by you know in November because that happened that was under President Clinton. So just be you know we we would say don't blindly invest ever on your politics. People didn't like President Obama, stock market went up. People didn't like President Trump, stock market went up. People didn't like President Biden. He had like the best first year of a president ever. That's when Rocky Sense were aware. But still, there's things to look at. But honestly, you know if things seem kind of close when this election is all over, which we think it will. That could just be one less worry, and then we got tons of other stuff to worry about. But maybe we get some good news and those positive seasonals. Last thing, and I swear I, I could talk all day on this stuff. If you look at the uh, midterm election day, the first Tuesday in November, whenever that is, and you go out 12 months, S&P's never been lower since World War II of 14% on average. Again, I get it. Lots of these wow. things didn't work lately. We, we get that. But we would just yeah. be aware, or we're trying to stress to the average investor and average advisor out there listening. We're talking to clients that are worried about what's going on out there. There really is a strong seasonal time frame coming up. So don't just sell now because stocks are down 25% and your bonds are down 15%. There's probably some really good opportunities if you can see over the horizon. And it's tough, believe me, to see. And this it's a, it's a, it's a bad storm out there right now. Um, but you can get past that. There's some better times coming. Yeah, you know, I, I had a couple of conversations yesterday with some individual investors and, you know, they're saying, well, why would I buy now? Why would I buy now? I said, well, look at some solid companies that you believe in down 75%. And yeah, maybe they end up down 85% before they bottom. But at 75%, they need to go up 300% to get back to even. Maybe they have 10 more percent in the downside. Quick math tells you it's a 30 to one reward to risk. That is one hell of a setup. Granted, they all may not go back, but there's a lot of companies that are down 75% that we know will go back to highs. It may take three to five years, but heck, where else in the world are you making 300% of your money in three to five years? Um, so I, I, I agree with you. I, I think there's some great opportunity out there right now. I know my subscribers, my listeners are sick of me saying it because I tend to lean bullish and I've seen opportunity for the last couple of months and they keep going down. But I, I think I agree with you, Ryan. Selling right now just makes no sense at all. The overall market, I'm not saying individual stocks, the overall market at this point. Um, but you mentioned inflation and Do you think what the Fed is doing right now, um, you know, being obviously very hawkish, aggressive with raising interest rates, that that, you know, it's a bit of a lag there until it actually takes effect on the economy and then thus pushing down uh, inflation? Because I I feel like we peaked on inflation. I don't think we much higher. I'm not saying it drops off the ledge in the next two months, but I think if anything, we're going to see good news coming from inflation. I'd like to get your view on that. Yeah, we're in that camp. I mean, yeah, we had the over 9% CPI data a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago. That was likely the peak in inflation, but the issue is it's kind of being a little stickier than I think we wanted. But you know, uh, it was um oh, Churchill said better to jar jar than war war, right? Talk a lot. Don't do so much. The Fed has talked a ton. It's incredible to me, Matt, when you look at what the Fed was saying, just look at the dot plots. I'm going to get too geeky here. But you look at the June 2001 dot plots, all right? Like the Fed was dovish. They thought there might be like one hike this year. That's a 25 basis point hike, all right? Every time I turn around, they're hiking 75. So just because the Fed now is hawkish, that doesn't mean that's what they're going to do. They were incredibly wrong 15, 16 months ago. And believe me, I probably was in that camp too, thinking they wouldn't hike. I don't know who thought they'd hike this much. Let's be very clear there. But the Fed, who has all the best models and best everything in the world, they didn't think at all they were going to hike this much. And that's what's kind of upset this apple cart so much. So back to your question, you know, you look at things like um, time to delivery and prices paid. I know today we had the PPI number came in a little bit stickier, but that had started to come down. You know, we're, we're seeing, you know, uh, the old the shipping costs from China to New York. I mean, we're seeing some things that say supply chains getting a little bit better. 
Some of these prices are coming down, and PPI is, it tends to be the last thing. I mean, you look at like rents. Rents finally month over month went down for the first time since December. That takes like six to nine months to make its way into CPI. Believe me, I don't know why. I don't understand it, but it does. So we're seeing prices come down. Just look at commodities. My goodness, I know some are sticky and some are high, but commodities have come back. So yeah, inflation is coming back. And now the question you're asking, though, and that's, this is what I don't have an answer for, if Fed's doing all this stuff. It's going to start hitting the system soon enough. I mean, are they just like crashing the car into a tree to stop the economy versus trying to get the soft landing? The soft landing is going to be tough. I think we all agree at that point. But, you know, the, is the Fed willing to have a recession? Because they last thing on this, they know in the early 80s, it took a double dip recession to kind of slay inflation, right? Will we need a mild recession this time? Can we truly not have a recession to get rid of inflation? I, nobody really knows. I mean, maybe we need a little bit of a mild recession. I'll tell you, look at housing in different areas. We are in a recession in certain areas of our economy, mm -hmm. but you don't have 3.8 million jobs this year, likely to be the second most jobs ever created in the history of our economy this year. That's not recessionary. Maybe a slowdown, sure, but not recessionary. So it's, uh, you know, I don't know, Fed's in a tough spot. I mean, with the war and all the different things, at the same time, they've been wildly wrong. So maybe they're not going to be so hawkish in a year. Let's just leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, I hate to use that word pivot because a lot of people are using yeah. it these days, but I, I do believe we will probably see one in 12 months uh, at some mm -hmm. point, you know, next year we will see a bit of a pivot or at least a minimum stopping the hikes probably early mid next year. Um, yeah. I, 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 to me, it's, it's, it is tough to convince people though, that inflation is slowing because if you go to a grocery mm -hmm. store, like I do, it's, it's, it's pretty, you have sticker shock. You do. And when, when you, mm -hmm. know, you see how much an apple and a banana costs, it's, that's kind of crazy. But you, you mentioned rents and, you know, one third of the CPI is shelter, rents and yep. housing. And you mentioned it's starting to roll over for the first time since December. I think to me, I'm trying to find an indicator, Ryan, when you start seeing rents and home prices come down, that could be the indicator that inflation will follow quickly down with it, which that would then be a great time to buy into the stock market. And you mentioned the, the early mm -hmm. 80s. We know in 1982, we started one of the greatest uh, bull markets ever, 82 yeah. through 2000. So maybe we're on a precipice of another great bull market. And I'm sure you know this, but, you know, I always look at the long term cycles, 16, mm -hmm. 18 year cycles, 80, you know, uh, 82 to 2000, 2000 through kind of 2014 wasn't as long. So we're really in a long term cycle, Ryan, we're only single digits into it. We're not mm -hmm. it, to me that that leaves another eight years to the upside. And maybe I'm crazy, but I, I'd love to get your view on that as well. No, I don't think you're crazy. I think you just infuriated a lot of people, though, because people hear that <laughs> and they get mad. And it's true, right? I mean, you know, from 2000 to 2013, the S&P literally went nowhere. I think it was March or April of 2013. That's when we broke out to new highs, likely starting a new secular bull market. Believe me, you know, now we've had this big pullback. But you look at these long cycles. I mean, I, I don't think it's going to happen, but hey. We're like a week away from the crash of 87, right? Stocks had the 20%, over 20% drop in one day. Stocks were up at 87. People forget that. That was just kind of a, a blip in the whole longer term, 18-year 18, 18 bull market or so. So I'm with you that these cycles last a lot longer than you think. And this likely is more of just a, a, going to be a blip. And believe me, it feels it feels worse than a blip right now. But likely yeah. going to be these cycles tend to last a lot longer. You know, last time I was on with you, maybe a year ago, I'm not even sure exactly. But, you know, I, I mentioned biotech. I like you said biotech was one of your favorite groups. You look at what's going on right now. You know, biotech, yeah, the stocks are down because every stock is down. But on a relative strength basis, you know, biotech is one of the strongest groups. Some are actually making new highs. You look around, you got industrials, relative strength, breaking out the 12-month high. Look at regional banks breaking out, again, on a relative basis versus the S&P, breaking out to new highs. You, you've got small caps, which haven't violated the June lows. A lot of negatives out there, yes. But there are some signs of healthcare, healthcare in general, biotech, healthcare. There are some groups out there that are really bucking the trend. I almost think it's almost as simple as tech is getting annihilated and continues to do so. So it's making everything look worse. It's the largest part of the S&P. But there are some other groups and areas that are hanging in there and doing OK. So investors need to know that. Last thing on this. I like I love the I'm not that smart, right? I look at history and I, I tell I tell stories what's going on. I do my best to, to give an example of what's happening. I look at the credit markets. They're smarter than me, they're smarter than you, they're smarter than anyone out there. You look at high yield spreads, okay? They're not higher than they were in early June or the June low. So the credit markets are not as worried about the monster under the bed right now as they were in June. If you look back in history, we've seen these areas, these times before when the stocks might make new lows, but the credit spreads on high yield spreads don't. That has made some major lows for the stock market because, again, the credit markets, they're smarter than all of us, and they're not as yeah. worried as everybody else is out there. So that's something I would not want to ignore. Yeah, and, that, and that's, that's a... a 
an area of the market that most people, the average person has looked at. So I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of people don't understand it, let alone look at it. Um, I want to go back to biotech real quick because on Tuesday's show, I, I mentioned some of the sectors that were holding up and biotech is. And you would think with this risk off trade, you know, the selling of, of the riskier assets, that biotech would be getting crushed. But boy, oh boy, is it holding up very well, as you said, relatively versus the overall market. Um, I see healthcare in the next 10 years and beyond changing the way we live. I mean, I just, from wearables to uh, gene editing, the breakthroughs that, we, that artificial intelligence, drug discovery, that we can't even imagine by the end of this mm -hmm. decade. And that's going to be driven by biotech. And to me, biotech has been silent for too long. I see such great opportunity. Do you guys do any research on the sectors too, Ryan, or just the big, the big picture stuff? Yeah, so I'm so new to Carson Group. We're more just big macro views on sectors, so we haven't gotten that granular yet, but we will. Um, but but I'm just saying, I, I'm agreeing with you. And hey, look at home builders, all right? I know, you know everyone knows what's going on with home building and the data and the things aren't that great. Relative strength, home builders versus the S&P is actually breaking out again to, I think, six-month highs like as we speak. So, again, are we really about to go into the world, into the next big calamity when you've got regional banks and home builders breaking out of relative strength and holding in there and small caps also doing well? Uh, my vote or my opinion would be no. Doesn't mean you can't go lower. But to have a massive 50% haircut like 2000 and 2008, it just doesn't feel like that because that's not what we're seeing when you look at some of the strength under the surface. And biotech leading is another good example of that, in my opinion. So I'm going to switch gears completely yeah. here, but I want to talk about the, the U.S. dollar. You know, um, oh, I thought we were going to talk been, about the Bengals and the Eagles. Not, not yet. Bengals, Eagles, we'll wait. We'll wait for that. Not, not okay. yet. I'm going to end on a high it. note with the Eagles being 5-0. I'll wait, and I'm not going to push you too hard. I want you to stay happy right now until, until we get to that. Um, you know, just looking at if, you know, for the average investor, the UUP, you know, the uh, Invesco U.S. Dollar Index uh, Fund, you know, near a high again, bounce back. It's up five days in a row, I think, going into today. Do you think we're near a peak in the dollar? Or do you think this trend continues? Yeah, well, I'll put it this way. I think we're near a peak. But then again, if we, you and I had this conversation three months ago, I might have said the same thing. And here, here's what's going on, right? The dollar is having like its best year ever. Well, that's another thing. In the very beginning, you asked me kind of this year. I think the dollar strength is a big surprise. I don't know. I mean, I just anecdotally, everybody talks about all oh, the dollar is going to crash. The dollar is going to crash. All the debt we've got. That hasn't happened at all because people flock to the safety of the U.S. dollar in times of uncertainty, right? 2008, we saw that. Tw March of 2020, the first two weeks, and people might forget this. Stocks were obliterated. You remember that. Bonds were crushed. Gold was crushed the first two weeks of March 2020. You know about the only thing that I know of that was up? The dollar, okay? Clean a shirt and a dirty laundry. Now, you flip that. When the dollar is strong, the truth is risk assets haven't done as well. So we need a peak in the dollar. And I'll tell you, you know, Open up. I'm a big fan of Barron's. I've been in there once or twice. Look at your cover of Barron's, right? Talking about the dollar being strong. Literally, they have a picture of George Washington with big muscles flexing. Reminding me of The Economist. The Economist had a cover. Look this one up. December of 2016, a similar picture of George Washington with big muscles talking about how strong the dollar is. The dollar peaked a week later, and then 2017 had a big move a big move lower, really, in 2018 also. So the sentiment on the dollar when the uh, reporters and that crew realize how strong it's been by the time they put two not one, but two magazine covers in the span of about a week and a half. That tells me those contrarian signals. I traded options for 11 years and everyone's thinking alike. Somebody isn't thinking. I use it already, but that's I believe that. Everybody's thinking yeah. the dollar's strong because it is. Um, oh, and the other thing, I forget which exchange it is. Probably shouldn't even say who it was. But one of the big exchanges has come out with new ways to trade the dollar. Right. You don't see that at the end of or you see that at the end of trends, not at the beginning of trends, thinking of new ways yeah. to trade something that's already had a great big run. So long winded answer. I sure think the dollar is close to a peak. And if it rolls over, that's going to help risk assets. Yeah. And don't you think that's going to help uh, the market in general? Yep. You know, considering so many multinationals here, obviously, uh, a strong dollar hurts the exports. And then for, you know, big export uh, country and a lot of these these firms get 50% or more of the revenue from overseas, that strong dollar hurts. So that, that could help the bottom line for a lot of large companies, which will obviously help earnings. And yep. speaking of earnings, uh, there's a planned segue, Good but segue. we're coming into earnings season right now. Yeah. Um, what's your view on earnings season? Obviously, the estimates have come way down. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think they've come down so far uh, that they're kind of sandbagging it. That, that mm -hmm. I think, you know, if anything, you know, if companies can't beat these lowered estimates, the companies are probably in trouble. But 
Boy, oh boy, I, I think these low estimates, Ryan, could be setting us up for some really strong numbers in the next couple of weeks. No, I tend to agree there, Matt. I mean, you think about the dollar being strong, right? It's almost like big companies, like the multinationals we just talking about, they've got a built-in excuse. It's, ah, the dollar and exchange rates are what's hurting us, yeah. even if they maybe had some issues. Again, this is not a recommendation of an individual stock, but like FedEx had some really disappointing things to say, but UPS, like a week before, didn't have anything to say like that, right? So is it company-specific? Is it economic? Is it a little bit of both? Um, those are those are just some things to think about. But earnings season, like you said, earnings for this year, okay, SP 500 earnings this year as we speak, expected to be up about 7 to 8%. At the start of the year, they were about 7 or 8%. They went higher throughout the first six months of the year, and they've absolutely come back a little bit. But I think most people don't realize that we're still looking at positive earnings growth this year. We're still, we'll are still we see what happens, right? But I like how you said sandbagging it. I, I, I tend to agree. I mean, that's what you see almost every earnings season, right? About 75 to 80% yeah. of companies beat, maybe a little less on revenue. That's how it works. But, uh, you know, I think that absolutely. And one final comment, if you look at the 11 sectors, who's the most earnings growth? Yeah, earn, it's, it's energy. I mean, energy is off the charts because – Whatever, throw them out there a little bit. Don't throw them out. You shouldn't do that. But put an asterisk next to it. And their prices are higher. Industrials, Matt, are the second uh, expected to be the second highest earnings, up over twenty percent. Tell me the last time we've had a recession when industrials are showing over twenty percent year over year earnings growth. I'll answer it for you. We never have. Okay. I mean, so again, there's worries out there, but you see industrial leadership. And if you look at R squared, industrials are the most um, similar to the overall. Market the SP 500 looking at R squared. So if industrials can firm up like they have been with some strong earnings growth, which is shocking if you think the, the world is about to end. If you listen to everybody out there, th there are some real positive things out there. Yeah, you, you mentioned you know earnings is going to still potentially be up seven to eight percent. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't think that, right? If 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 you just looked at the market and the, and the performance, you'd think they'd be down seven eight percent, if not double digits versus the prior year. And you know, I think you have to keep in mind last year was. A, a good year for earnings. I mean, we've had a huge rebound from 2020. We came back quickly. So we're going now against much stronger numbers. You know, 2021, we get against, we get against the pandemic numbers. So those look very, very good. And they're not as high as they were last year. Right. But still, 7 to 8% growth, that's pretty damn good. And, and, you know, when I look for individual stocks, Ryan, I've had my team recently, and I've gone back on, through, through a lot of recessions and bear markets, and you find companies that fell during that time 50 70%. But they continue to increase revenue, individual companies, the entire time through that. You're seeing companies do that now that are down 75%, but revenues are going up 20% a year. There's something that doesn't make sense to me when I see this. But again, I, I, I hate to say that but I kind of like this because I think it creates opportunity mm -hmm. for people that are willing to be contrarians and think outside the box. Um, so when it comes to these earnings, I, I think we're going to see a huge surprise. And just to kind of recap everything here, you know, we have inflation potentially rolling over, right? Yep. We have the midterm elections that could take uh, a little bit off the plate and, and maybe give a bit of a catalyst. We have the seasonality that you talked about already. And you have, you know, valuations that are low, in my opinion. Yep. You have the market already down 24, 25%, which non-recessionary is about what they pull mm -hmm. back anyway. You have sentiment at, at historic lows. So when you put this all together, Ryan, it sounds so terrible right now, but... It also feels like, holy smokes, what a time to be alive and an opportunity in front of us. No, mm -hmm. oh, uh, wow. You summed it up pretty well there. I was trying to think of anything else. I mean, no, you're right. I mean, those, maybe the dollar peaking. I mean, but yeah, you put all that together. There, yeah. There's some opportunity. And again, you know, the worst time to jump off of a boat in the middle of a of a of a um, of a storm is in the middle of a storm, right? You want to hunker down. We're in the middle of it, right? So don't change your investment thesis. Don't change your investment philosophy in the middle of the storm. Is when you need to be hunkering down and think about the things you just said from a bigger picture. That you know, it's um. There is uh, there is opportunity. It doesn't feel like it. But again, did it really feel like in 87 when the market crashed or the three year bear market in the 2000, early 2000s or the, you know, the, the cut in half in the financial crisis, blah, blah, blah. We can keep going. You guys have seen it. But, you know, I'll put it like this. The Dow started trading on May 24th, 1896. Charlie Dow made it right. It's had a lot of bear markets, had a lot of bad things happen since 1896. It's also always come back to a new high, and I think that could happen again. And one more thing on this, you got me thinking about stocks pull back a lot. Jeff Bezos was man of the year in 99, time man of the year, right? Company, Amazon, everything was great. They went down, I believe, 85 86% during the tech bubble, right? It kind of threw them out. Then they obviously came back to be what they are. So the, believe me, some companies aren't coming back. That, that's probably true with what yep. we've just seen. But there are some really solid companies, growing revenue, growing profits, keeping profit margins high, earnings, all that stuff that you just talked about that are going to come from this and, and be the next leaders. And, and those are the ones that I know you're going to help your, um, your subscribers find. Thank you. So 
Before we wrap, two things. Um, one, I will say, I, I still believe in Joe Burrow behind you. He's had a, a bit of a rougher year after last year, but I still think they're a very good team. Um, I think Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, Joe Mixon, you have a hell of an offensive team there, and I think you'll pull around. You may not catch my Eagles, uh, but I think you'll have a hell of a season. Second thing, Ryan, is I always ask my guests, um, if I were to send you and your family away from Cincinnati for 10 years to a beautiful island of your choice, is there one investment that you'd be comfortable with? And I know you may not be able to mention anything, you know, in, in where you're working now, but is there an investment? It could be a, a, fee, a, a, a trend, a theme that you'd be comfortable with for the next 10 years, not looking at and owning. Yeah, I'll tell you, I like value over growth. I mean, I, I don't think it's done. I mean, growth led for so long and did so well. I think it's we've got some major peaking. If you look at these relative strengths of value versus growth, um, believe me, growth will probably do well. There'll be parts of that. But I, I think that's one big trend that is only going on for just like a year or so, right? I mean, not that long, right? I think that's a trend that can last a lot longer than than uh, than a lot of people are thinking. And the Bengals very quickly, um, you know, the I got four new starters. On the O line, Joe's still getting beat up a little bit, but the defense, their defense actually is really good. Their offense hadn't scored 20 points in three games out of the five. So the offense got some issues, but the defense is keeping a minute. So if the offense can start clicking, maybe we can uh, make another run. I mean, they, they were only like, what, I think 10 and seven last year in the regular season. Then they just got hot at the right time. So, you know, yeah. There's a, there's a quote Jim Carrey, you're saying there's a chance. I think they still got a chance. Just got to get through the uh, <laughs> – yeah, it just get through the Super Bowl hangover, which is legit. I think it's legit. I mean, look at the – As an Eagles fan, I yeah. saw it years ago. So, yeah. yeah exactly. Oh, real quick, yeah. I, you, you mentioned value, Ryan. I, I feel like I, one of our, our – um, one of my colleagues, Dan Ferris, has a podcast also, big value guy. And him and I kind of butt heads a lot because he tends to be very bearish and be bullish. Mm -hmm. Um and he's talking about value as well. We, we had a meeting a few weeks ago. We all got together. And my question is, it seems like there's a blurred line these days between some value stocks and growth stocks where, yeah. you know, if you look at the makeup of like the S&P value portion of it, it doesn't seem like it used to be back in the day. Back in the day, value was, you know, the consumer staples, utilities, that type of stuff. Now it seems like there's some quote unquote tech stocks in value too. How do you kind of differentiate that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, look at a company like Amazon, right? They're like in the drug delivery business now. I mean, you know, like the, these companies do a little bit of everything. And that's that's a great point. I mean, I guess to us, we look at it and, you know, the staples and utilities are there. But I mean, you know, energy and financials also are, are, are part of that. So it's... um. It is more blurred. That's a, that's a great point. So getting st sector specific, we didn't even talk about energy. I mean, my goodness, if you look at it, like energy, yes, it's been tremendous for two years. But if you take out dividends, the XLE is like where it was in 2008. So energy stocks literally have gone nowhere for 14, 15 years. The question, of course, is, is that mean the rally is just getting started? Is the rally over? I think there's there's more legs there. So, you know, some, some of the energy names and, and your financials, those are some groups I think that can continue to do pretty well here. And those are the areas we like on, um, on the value side of things i like that and i you know i tend to lead more innovation growth but i, I as i've been saying for, yeah. for months now you need to have a diversified portfolio you need yep. to have aspects of, of energy and you know i believe in electric vehicles i believe in battery technology that being said that transition is going to take decades we still need fossil fuel and mm -hmm. it's not going away anytime mm -hmm. soon and right. i think we're starting to realize that with what's going on in, in europe right now and and the yeah. demand and especially if the global economy picks up Boy, oh boy, I think oil's back in triple digits pretty quickly. Yeah, or if OPEC keeps cutting like they want, it might be. But that's a whole other story for another day. But that's yes, all. Yeah, we, 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 I try to yeah. stay away from politics. I know. I politics do too. Try and try yeah, we, we talk about midterms. <laughs> that, was, that was enough. I mentioned red and blue. Hopefully no one threw anything at me. But yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's as far as I go. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, listen, um, thanks so much for coming back on again. Again, you're, you're – uh, Thank you for everything you do. I love your work. I, I quote you all the time. I hope you don't mind. I, I put it in my Absolutely. stuff. You're, you're always quoted. We, we put you in there. But yeah, thank you. Keep up the great work. And uh, let's have you back uh, early next year and catch up. And hopefully we're talking about the rally that's undergoing at the time. Or hopefully we're talking about that uh, Bengal Eagle Super Bowl. Maybe we'll be talking about that. That would actually. Yeah, there you go. This is a financial show, but I'd actually kind of like that instead. Let the <laughs> bear awesome. market go a little bit longer. I, I would yeah. give I give up some stock prices for the Eagles Bengals Super Bowl. I would. There you go. So, yep. Hey, listen, Ryan. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, we'll see you again soon. I appreciate the opportunity, Matt. Thank you. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.